Morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, I know my last episode polarizes people when I talk about the avant-garde free jazz and the people who kind of follow it. And I know people genuinely love it, or some people think they love it. Some people really do love it. But it, is, it reveals something about everybody anyway. You know, if you like only the spiciest food all the time, there's it still says something about the extreme nature of how you present to the world, you know? And <clears throat> I'm, I'm proud to admit, like, I have plenty of that stuff in myself. I'm speaking about my own self-analysis often when I reflect on other people as well. <clears throat> and one of the strangest misconceptions I feel is that people think I don't like avant-garde and free jazz. I've listened to more of it than most of y'all. Bet. I mean, I got tons of it. I listened to a lot of it for a long time, where it was predominantly what I listened to. <clears throat> My jazz realm didn't expand much beyond those horizons. It was Pharoah Saunders and Albert Eiler and Cool Essay Mama and the Coltrane and just I, I was off the edge. I was deep into that stuff, you know. <clears throat> and uh, it's not like I don't like it. It just has to have its right place. Just I mean, it has to be the right day or the mood for me to go. Let me jump into Ascension. Thirty minutes of uh, Yoko Ono shrieking sounds wonderful to me right now. It takes a pretty stressed out day. I think when we're younger men, we can handle the chaos and cacophony a little differently. I feel like it's a little bit more of a test of our mettle and our, our spiritual journey. And we're kind of willing to swim through some difficult rapids. As we get older, we're more like, oh, this pool looks relaxing here. Let me stay in that relaxing bit of water and stay out of that current. Uh, some of that stuff has a lot to say. Conversely, some of it has nothing to say. And I, I feel like I've tried a lot of different ways to express things I feel about it and how, where it should belong. And it's always not necessarily even what I'm trying to get across. I think people just often misconstrue what I'm saying. And again, I do like avant-garde, especially free jazz, and not as much. Uh, spiritual jazz, I mean, there's nothing more spiritual than the blues. Nothing more spiritual than the black church. And some of that spiritual stuff is so far away from spirituality. It's a very misnamed and not as easy as an accessible form of the music as some people want to think that it is. But again, I want to explain my kind of, I won't say obsession, but just my, how why I'm disturbed by it. And it's not just my perceptions and, and realizations and epiphanies about the free and the avant-garde. It's about the vinyl collecting community in general. And I feel like I've been, my point was more about the, the pressings talk and the lack of perception or feeling from the music and the art than it was about the uh, free, free jazz avant-garde jazz. I mean, if you offhand any comments about it, that to most people it is crap. And they, they listen to it, it turns them off. And that's my biggest evangelism in terms of free jazz. It's telling people you don't have to like it to be a jazz lover. So many free jazz, avant-garde jazz people turn their nose up to so much of the jazz history. And that condescending as fuck towards Brubeck and Modern Jazz Quartet and all the wonderful stuff that came back for decades. And they act so posh and pompous and disregard the entire foundation, the entire trunk of the tree. They think it's just some branch that exists in its own and doesn't have this entire history and body of work behind it that's far more accessible and far more enjoyable and they disparage it and they talk shit about it all the time and I always just take umbrage with that I just think it's uh, a great disservice to spreading the gospel of this music and that's where my next point really is what I want, what I want, to, what I want to try to get across here is I yearn I long for belonging, for a place in this world, in this cosmos. I want to feel something. And I thirst. I thirst for that spiritual intercession, that place of prayer and serenity and mystery where it just kind of aches and pains can melt away into the sacrifices of what others have experienced. And they almost... To use a biblical term, they've almost sacrificed and been on the cross for me. They've suffered for me. And their suffering 
and survival through that suffering, it's a, it's a ministry. It's an uplifting experience that's meant to elevate you and bring healing and, and completion and spiritual definition. And for a person who yearns and looks for meaning and purpose and thirsts for that place of belonging, this is the best way I can describe how it makes me feel. I feel like jazz in general is spiritual water. It's spiritual water. It's life affirming. Uh, life is hard. And I need this. I don't want this. And that's why the pressings to me are so secondary. I don't want, I need that uplifting perspective of people who have toiled so greatly, so far more than my struggle, and have overcome it. I mean, that's, in the end of the day, that's, that's the message, that's the point. And I think that's what I've always been trying to express. And I think there's such a great celebration and a great revelation in that meaning and definition that sitting there discussing the pressings and stuff almost feels sacrilegious at times to me if you don't want to acknowledge that stuff first. And I, I could sit there at a record store and talk pressings with people. I don't mind talking pressing. It's just it can't be the only barometer. <clears throat> and as much as I thirst for meaning and spiritual water, when I find that pool that I can partake from. I am certainly not going to sit there and debate <clears throat> what color chalice should I drink it from. I'm dying of thirst here. I am so thirsty. This life, it's carnal, it's evil, it's dark, it's oppressive. It's weighted. I need some joy juice. And if I'm dying of thirst and crossing this wilderness and you present me with a chalice of water and I look at it and say, oh, that Dr. Chalice is gray. And don't you see how that, it's got a little crack right there. I mean, the water's not leaking, but I'm not sure that's the chalice for me. It either speaks of a lack of thirst on my part or a lack of understanding that this is a thirst quenching device and as thirsty as I am and as much as I need this music to heal and to quench my spiritual uh, drought I want other people to kind of be able to envelop themselves and bathe themselves in that same elevating positivity that same ability for it to help me overcome and get through my day and my struggle. And so when I hear people talking about pressings for 30 minutes and then not even discuss the music or what it makes them feel or the high elevating nature of it, I'm like, aren't you thirsty? Why aren't you drinking? Why don't you tell me how thirst quenching that music is? And the thing about it is, Eddie Lockjaw Davis record, a Horace Silver record, has all the thirst quenching capacity of anything spiritual, free or avant-garde. <clears throat> and a lot of that stuff to me gets so cerebral and so focused on being bizarre and trying to reinvent something that some of the angles actually make the chalice leak. I mean, that weird little partition you put on that bowl, it, the water's pouring out of that. Your focus was so on making the bowl interesting. And so the musicians themselves at times can diminish the thirst quenching ability of the music by making it something that puts me in a place that's not spiritual. And it's a fine line. And no two people are going to perceive all of this the same. But again, I know thousands of black African Americans in Minneapolis from my DJ years. I understand the plight of the black community fairly well. I can't say I've experienced it, but I've felt persecution. I got the shit kicked out of me every day for two years back in sixth and seventh grade for my parents' evangelism in a strong Mennonite community that was very conservative and traditional. My parents' holy role in speaking in tongues 
was cult status for most of these people. And I got the shit kicked out of me. Not just saying figuratively they teased me online. They chased me around at recess, held me down and beat the shit out of me. Kicked me in the face. The girls would come over and spit on me and kick me in the nuts. I seen how it feels to be an outsider, to be ostracized, to be scared to walk through the streets and not know where safety was and who could I confide in. And even sometimes the principals and people in the school that were supposed to protect me offered me nothing. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that for empathy or sympathy right now. I'm saying because it's what's given me empathy for others. And when I got into music and DJing and I started developing a black following, that community really attached itself to me because I could feel their thirst and I was feeding their thirst with music I knew that they liked. And it grew into a strong relationship and I became a pretty entrenched part of that community for a long time. So my empathy for the black experience is strong, which makes me understand the power of that music, the biblical context of a people oppressed in the wilderness for centuries, longing for a promised land. And my mom gets all the spirituality and edification from a story that's two, three thousand years old. There's one here that's two, three hundred years old that's writing scriptures and psalms 50, 70, 80 years ago that could elevate you just as much with a more current context, with living legends still in the shadows around us, tangibly still on this planet, in this sphere, walking among us. And their legacy, their psalms, their proverbs are all here on the vinyl that we talk about every day. It quenches my thirst. It fills my cup. It gives me the glue to keep this together. And when days are tough, and they are tough sometimes, I have an 18-year-old kid who's dropping out of school, not, not doing anything, has no life's plan. His despondency and desperation and hopelessness and depression <clears throat> are suicidal ideations at times. And I, I've tried my best to navigate my stepchild, both of them, and neither of them took any listening into my direction. In spite of me being a musician and being a successful DJ and launching a YouTube channel, and opening a cafe and following all my dreams and doing things and making them come to reality, setting an example, trying to teach them about geography and history and the world and music and art, <clears throat> watching infinite films and television shows with these guys. They've taken none of me into themselves at all, at least at this point. And they both turn into their father, sit around playing video games all day and not applying themselves to any other facet of life. Like, I mean, to the point of zero. I've asked them both, what have you accomplished in your life outside of gaming that you're most proud of? And it's a long pause and there's no, no response. At 18, I had dozens of things, adventures, accomplishments, interests, hobbies, passions that I could have listed off. Boom, boom, there's two dozen things that I'm looking forward to. That's a part of my future, my destiny, my life. And turning 18 is the beginning of the road, not the end. All of this is supposed to be training and preparing you for that. So I got some darkness and s s sadness. And this, this water fills my thirst. Quenches my soul. It makes me go, man, I didn't have a brother lynched today. My neighbor didn't burn to the ground last month. I don't have to leave this home every day walking down the street wondering, is today, that, today the day I get arrested for something I didn't do? or get accused for looking at someone's woman the wrong way and get strung up on my neck or beat to a pulp or dragged behind a pickup truck. I don't know what that feels like. I mean, I have elements of it, but I don't have that persecution in my life today. And so it makes me go, hmm, boy, I should be thankful. My stepkids are both struggling and I did my best. I mean, I could sleep at night knowing I definitely put as much effort in as I possibly could. <clears throat> I give them more of myself and my soul for 10, 11 years than most step parents. And I was acknowledged for that the first seven, eight years. But as they reached 17, 18 and the pandemic and their schooling just went to hell, my frustration with them, my disappointment. I mean, it was hard for me to see them stray so far from the path and to be so unhappy with the choices they're making but unwilling to make any changes in their decisions. That was tough for me. It's like, if you were happy, God bless. Go do what you think you need to do. You have a plan. That's good. Go execute it. 
find your happiness. Some Charlie Ventura here, fantastic stuff. Sounds like he's on the baritone there. I didn't know Ventura played the baritone, but that's definitely a baritone honking and swonking right there. This is actually a Tops release that was reissued here by uh, Craftsman, which is like their, it might be their stereo version of their mono stuff. I'm not positive, but Craftsman and Tops, it's the same stuff, just different covers. But, uh, and Tops is kind of a budget label to begin with from the West Coast. But there's still some good stuff on there. And anytime you can find an old Charlie Ventura record, the Philadelphia Tenorman, I mean, Ventura's the real deal. He's a, he's a fantastic player. So, <clears throat> the sacrilege for me isn't just that, oh, you're talking about pressings. Oh, that's all you, that's your only point of reference. It's like, I think you're missing the gift, the balm, the cooling, soothing, refreshing water, the spiritual juice. And I want that to be what comes across. Not me disparaging people talking about pressings or free jazz or avant-garde. <clears throat> My biggest problem with free jazz, and many pe people in the jazz world felt this way, is it drove more people away than it ever brought in. And I think that's a shame because this music is such an important part of American history. And so I'm trying to elevate the body of the, of the canon above that one branch that was part of its death knell. That shouldn't be what all people think of when they think of jazz. And way too many people think that's what jazz is. It's something difficult and unpleasant to listen to. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And I prove it every day in here. It's not some myth. There's thousands of wonderful jazz records that everybody would love. And we keep forcing stuff that few people are going to like down their throats. If you were a chef, you'd be fired. If you made a meal that drove most people away, you wouldn't have a job. Let's get people to love this music because it has power, it has meaning, it has purpose beyond just how cool is my fucking collection. <clears throat> Spiritual water. I bathe in it. And the only other music that really gives me that, I mean, a lot of black American music gives me that in elements. Soul music can do it. But words are sometimes less creative and imaginative and expressive than uh, the soul speaking through a horn or a piano player. I mean, I love Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Curtis Mayfield, all those great records that had a lot to say. Some of the Isaac Hayes stuff is fantastic. And, you know, and I love certain hip-hop records, but they don't th fill my thirst quite the same way. And nor can I listen to it quite as frequently anymore. Possibly because DJing kind of, you know, you burn out on superstition. You know, I mean, you burn out on well, I hate to say what's going on, but God, I've played what's going on so many freaking times, you know. And that stuff does have some, some power to it. But it's actually reggae music. That's the other thing that really edifies me. And Bob Marley is probably my favorite artist of all time. His accessibility is universal. And I posted uh, the first one, Catch a Fire, yesterday on Facebook. And a lot of people are kind of surprised that it was one of my favorite artists and favorite records. I'm like... I mean, the same elevating nature of that music, an oppressed people speaking up through art, finding joy and freedom, delivering joy to their community. It exists in reggae and spades. And I've been enjoying a lot of the Afrobeat stuff out of Nigeria, uh, some really positive, uplifting R&B, two-step Afrobeat, a lot of really good melodies, hum-along stuff. It's a little more secular, a little less spiritual than the reggae stuff, but it's got elements of dance hall, it's got elements of reggae, it's got elements of hip hop and R and B. I like a lot of that Afrobeat stuff. It's really good, and I play it in the cafe sometimes. But reggae music, especially, it really speaks to my soul and gives me what jazz gives me a lot. And I want to give a, a nod here, a tip of the cap to DJ Khaled, who uh, he's always been a periphery guy. Who I've you know I've downloaded tracks of his over the years for DJ sets. You know, the one with Rihanna, uh, that's, a, that's a nice little song. It's a simple pop song. Some stuff with Drake's fine. You know, he's, I don't know how talented the guy is himself. I think he's a DJ. I don't think he does much production himself. I think he mostly is, an, is, a, is a figure that can put celebrities in the music business on tracks on his records. Say, we the best music, DJ Khaled. And that's I think, the extent of what he does, from my understanding. And so he's always been kind of someone I... I would look at briefly, maybe find a song or two and like it and play them from my sets for a little while. But I was never a huge DJ Khaled fan. However, I stumbled on some reggae tracks, dance hall tracks. On his last three records, I think he's a Miami native, if I remember. And he always had dance hall in his youth. 
and so on. On these last three records, like one's called Kala Kala, one called one is called the Son of Kala, I think, and the other one's called God. God did. I think those are his last three albums from 1920-21. Each record there's this dance hall reggae number, and he brings in Buju Bantan. He brings in Sizzla. He brings in Capleton. He brings in Barrington Levy. He brings in uh, Bounty Hunter, Bounty Killer. Sorry. And he's bringing in these massive dancehall stars from the 80s and 90s and giving them a platform to reach a new audience of young kids. And these songs are pretty fantastic. Holy Mountain, These Streets Know My Name, Where Are You From? Those three songs, boy, they really have a spiritual message. And those dancehall voices kicking those verses on these more produced, well-polished kind of dancehall with some elements of hip-hop, and pop production, it really gives a new platform and a stage for these old masters to project these incredible messages of oppression and freedom to a younger generation. So kudos to Khaled for that. I mean, because Buju Bantan's a real deal. He, he has some things to say. Bounty Killer says some stuff. Sizzla, wise man. Capleton, I mean, he'll take you to the mountain himself. Barrington Levy, where I come from, 90 Dreadlock. I mean, that's a classic old Levy, Levy song that they sample, and I think it's a Holy Mountain. No, it's from where I'm from. But those three songs have been really ministering to me a lot lately. And my wife's been kind of getting into that stuff as well, which is, is nice. And then I also want to really give credit to Damian Marley, who I've always been a big fan of Damian Marley. I like most of the Marley boys. Bob's, of course, one of my true platform artists. But Damian Marley's last record, he has a song called Speak Life. And if you can listen to that song, Speak Life, watch the video on YouTube where he's strolling the streets of Addis Ababa, just connecting with the people in the faces, the grizzled old men, the young, beautiful women. You're, you're seeing the real deal in the streets of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And if it doesn't make your hair stand on end and your fucking tears well up and feel the positivity, and at the end of the song he says, Speak Life, all this darkness not feel right. And boy, it makes my, just all of my consciousness just, oh, it gives me a shiver. The whole song is just this gorgeous tour de force of how to live positively, lead a humble and meek life, and every day of the week life. Damien, my phone for some reason has some pop-up thing and my video ended there, but uh, Damien really uh, nails it to the cross. It makes my skin hair stand up and just the back of my neck. It's just, it's just gorgeous. And the backdrop of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, it's so real and surreal at the same time. And it seems like there's a lot of people in the video walking around with loads on their head. Grains, tree, tree I mean, just moving stuff the old traditional way. And I don't know if it was by design anyway, but it seems to be talking about the load and the burden that we carry. Uh, just wonderful. I'm going to move on now and to my one other subject today. And it's the tone poet I just picked up. Passing ships. No, sorry, not passing ships. Dance with Death by Andrew Hill. I believe it was from 68. Recorded that with Van Gelder, Frank Wolf. Uh, I see Harley and Kevin Gray on the tone poet remastering in addition once again the uh, packaging is just top of the mark gorgeous done just wonderfully had a couple customers there so we're gonna talk about uh andrew hill dance with death as i was saying again wonderful packaging by the tome poet people obviously the photographs are by francis wolf a wonderful Blue Note uh, historian. It's an interesting session. It's not as out as you would think for 68. And Andrew Hill can be kind of out at times. But Black Fire is a great record. I mean, his early work at Blue Note's really quite outstanding. He's an interesting cerebral cat. There's a spirituality to Andrew Hill that I've always loved. And it's not to say there's not some angles here. But it's actually, it's more straightforward than I think some people would think for Andrew Hill at this point. Victor Sproles and Billy Higgins show up as the rhythm section. It's a fairly young 
Victor Sproul's sighting. And it's interesting, I just realized there's no picture of Victor Sproul's in there. Joe Farrell is playing on the tenor on this, who uh, makes a few sessions at Blue Note, but he's more of a 70s leader. Uh, and a pretty out guy himself at times. Charles Tolliver's on the trumpet. And Billy Higgins, of course, with a cowboy hat. He's throwing it down. I listened to my other day, other day with my friend Al, who came by. I uh, was about an hour away, and Al's a, a great jazz fan, and I uh, enjoy my chats with Al a lot. And we listened to it, and we were both kind of, like, intrigued. It was it was beautiful. I mean, it was dark. It was, you know, I mean, it had some spiritual uh, mysticism at times, which I think is a great way to talk about Andrew Hill as a spiritual mystic. And he's not going to foment his brew to the point where it's undigestible. He wants people to drink the medicine. And so he keeps it with a lot of healing power with a spoonful of sugar, you know? And uh, again, the, the work being done by uh, the Tone Poet people, it's really quite commendable. Uh, I can't remember exactly how long ago this came out. I was just searching Amazon the other day to see what I've been missing from Tone Poet. And they haven't been doing a lot of deep releases that I didn't have lately. And it seems like the gaps between releases have been growing, whether it's the demand and the, the demand for the pressing plants is what I mean. But uh, <clears throat> there's a T Stanley Turntine coming out next month, which I pre-ordered. And Turntine has a lot of work at Blue Note, but a lot of it didn't get issued at the time it was made, uh, probably because he was recording so much. So I'm looking forward to that Turntine, and I'm guessing that one will stay pretty, pretty easy to get. But... Uh, all in all, this, this uh, Dance with Death, again, it comes after the Blue Note sale, which happens in 67. So this is recorded under the guidance of Liberty. And I don't see Albert lying here at all. And I thought Albert stayed for a little while, whether he just missed this session or whether he was, my memory, I thought it was Frank Wolf who left first. Was it Al who left first, the Blue Note stable, after the sale? I know both Al and Frank weren't happy with a lot of the things happening at Blue Note after the sale to Liberty. It was disheartening for them. And I think they tried to kind of keep steering the ship. But at some point you realize that this steering wheel is not really connected to nothing, is it? This is just a figurative steering wheel. And the captain up there is really the one piloting this motherfucker. And so I don't think Al and Frank were thrilled with a lot of the direction and the art choices. If I remember, Reed Miles leaves right away. And the graphic department at Blue Note just bombs out. Some of the worst covers in jazz come out on those Liberty Blue Note covers. Uh, and the United Artists buys Liberty not long after that. So United Artists gets credit for some of that stuff as well. But again, a great addition to the Tone Poet family. And he's one of those guys, Andrew Hill, that can straddle the line between the avant-garde, hard bop, post-bop, modernism, composition with some black gospel and blues. He seems to have elements of all of it present most of the time. And from Black Fire to Passing Ships, it's a pretty solid body of work. Uh, I think the saddest thing is that Andrew Hill, who was always a fairly obscure artist is become quite popular today which is great for him but he shouldn't be more popular than the Horace Silvers or even the Teddy Wilsons I mean there's a lot of giants in this music on the piano hundreds of them and uh, he's really kind of climbing the charts here in popularity in the last 20 years and like I said good for him his, his body of work is fantastic but again the Blue Note legacy has become so enshrined and there's such a mysticism around it and in many ways deservedly so but it comes at the expense of so much else that predates the stuff and even the early blue note stuff doesn't get nearly the uh preponderance of viewers as some of this later stuff does so i get i really do enjoy andrew hill's stuff I enjoy the kind of dark angles that exist. 
And a lot of times you can be listening and they'll be like, you'll raise an eyebrow. You know, that was kind of an interesting little course change, direction change. And just uh, blue note. And again, that term comes from those kind of interesting notes that jazz ins inserts that may not be part of the chord, but it gives it a feeling. It gives it a sense of uh, desperation, perhaps, or darkness, or ominous. And those things are always interesting and reflective. And uh, again, it's a wonderful piece, worth grabbing if you can find it. Like Amazon still has it, but they're like, the price of these tone poets keeps, seems to keep going up. Whether it's just inflation or in demand or uh, just making a few extra bucks on their part. I'm not going to criticize anybody for making a few extra bucks. If the demand's there, you mark it up. You know, uh, Amazon seems to always be the cheapest place to find tone poets. And uh, it's funny how you'll often see three new ones at a consistent price. They might have like two, three, four, five used ones. And oftentimes the used ones are more expensive. And I'm not sure what the thinking is there. Why would anybody buy a used one for 50 when there's a new one for 42? Not really sure how your fingerprints have added enough value to that record to make me want to purchase it. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. Andrew Hill, Dance With Death. Good job. Fantastic uh, congratulations, Tom Paul. You guys have done it again. Great piece. And again, spiritual water. Are you thirsty? Because if you're thirsty, drink. And if you're sitting around arguing about the chalice of what cup you should drink this water from, I think you might have missed the point of the refreshing spiritual water that jazz is. So I hope that helps people understand what I'm talking about a little bit. I'm going to leave it at that today. Y'all have a great day. We'll talk to y'all soon. Peace. Subscribe to the channel. If you want to support the channel, go to my Patreon. Pledge a few bucks a month. It does help me make content, buy some new material, uh, inspire me to buy stuff. I uh, appreciate the commentary, everybody. Leave your comments and thoughts. What's your favorite tone poet? And what tone poet do you most want to see come out? Talk to you soon.